once I had to wear a wig, you know. Did you? Yeah. Why? When I went in hospital. Was it a straight one or a curly one? Curly one. What colour was it? It, were, uh, it was auburn, similar colour to Maureen Long survived the Yorkshire Ripper. The killer hit her with a hammer and slashed her with a knife. All I know is that I've got a plate in my head and um, a bit of my, uh, some of my skull missing and stab wounds up front of my stomach and stabbed in the back. Mrs. Long was left for dead in 1977. The Yorkshire Ripper haunted the streets of the north of England for another five years. By the end, Peter Sutcliffe had murdered 13 women. On the nights when one wakes up sweating about cases from the past, it's the Sutcliffe era which even now, in my 60s, I remember most clearly in the whole of my career as a forensic pathologist. It was the biggest manhunt in British criminal history. Twenty years on, detectives involved break their long silence to reveal how it ended for the police in humiliation and disgrace. Even to this day, you're, you're always thinking of what might have been, what you might have done where you could have gone, could you have done things any different? I'll live with that for the rest of my life. I'll live with being a party to the wrong decision. All along, the identity of the killer lay hidden in police files. Interviewed nine times, lost in the system. Peter Sutcliffe, free to kill again. October 1975, the Prince Philip playing fields in Leeds. The first victim of the Yorkshire Ripper died within sight of the home she shared with her four young children. Her name was Wilma McCann. She was 28 years old and came from Scotland. She'd been hit over the head, her blouse pulled up, her trousers pulled down, and stabbed 14 times. January 1976, three months later, another Leeds woman got into a car with a man who said he wanted to pay her for sex. He drove her to an industrial wasteland, now buried beneath the inner city motorway. Her name was Emily Jackson. She was a married woman of 42 and a mother of three children. This time, the killer left a single clue, a boot print on Mrs. Jackson's leg. As West Yorkshire police launched a second murder hunt, newspapers were already calling the killer Jack the Ripper. The post-mortem revealed Emily Jackson had been hit with a hammer and stabbed 51 times with a Phillips screwdriver. Michael Green has just retired as professor of forensic pathology at Sheffield University. As deputy to the Home Office pathologist David G. He was involved in the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper from the outset and helped identify the weapons the killer used. Well, these are all of them ordinary tools that one will find around the house, but on examination of the injuries at first, no clear pattern emerged. Subsequently, of course, it became obvious that a pattern was emerging of two or three heavy blows, usually to the back of the head, 
curved laceration through the skin, round depressed fracture underneath it, would produce quite severe brain damage, immediate unconsciousness, and death will occur fairly shortly afterwards. And uh, so the hammer rapidly became a trademark. The dead women were both prostitutes. As their confidential telex made clear, West Yorkshire police made the obvious deduction. Motive appears to be hatred of prostitutes. It meant they discounted assaults on women who were not prostitutes. Women who had already given photofit descriptions of a bearded attacker. Wakefield, 1972. Bradford, 1975. Keithley, 1975. And then Leeds, 1976. A photofit from Marcella Claxton. Four months after the second murder, Marcella Claxton came out of a party in Leeds and got into a car with a stranger. She thought he was taking her home. Instead, he brought her here to Round Hay Park and attacked her with a hammer. And he hit me on my head. Then I found myself on the grass, knocked out. And then when I come round, that's when I walk all the way down there. Take my knickers out to wipe my head. What was happening on your head? Clouds were coming out of my head. Big, big piece of clouds. My head was bleeding. And I was four months pregnant as well. What happened to the baby? I lost that. In pitch darkness, Marcella Claxton staggered half a mile to the road clutching her knickers to her head to staunch the blood. She reached the phone box. She called an ambulance. But the police never included Marcella Claxton in the Ripper case. They discounted her photo fit because she wasn't a prostitute and hadn't been attacked with a knife. But nine months later, a bearded attacker went back to Round Hay Park with another woman in his car. This time, he took her behind the sports pavilion. This time, he left clearly identifiable tire marks. And this time, he killed her. Her name was Irene Richardson. She was 28, recently separated from her husband and three children. She'd been hit on the head three times with a hammer, stabbed brutally in the stomach, neck, and throat. Police uncovered a macabre new twist. The killer had arranged his victim's body, unzipped her knee-length boots and laid them carefully, neatly, over the back of her thighs. These were not frenzied attacks. This was the sort of man who thought about what he had done, planned his attack carefully, and then was concerned to arrange everything about the body to have the maximum shock impact upon whoever came upon the scene first and those who came afterwards. Police in Leeds were now dealing with a serial killer who had murdered three women. The city was full of policemen asking questions. The killer kept one step ahead and moved on, eight miles, to Bradford. The Carlisle pub stands in one of the roughest areas of inner city Bradford. The Yorkshire Ripper's fourth victim went drinking here on the night of her death. She got into her killer's car outside the pub. She took him home to her flat. As she walked through the door, he attacked her with a hammer. Police found her body face down on the bed.
Her name was Patricia Atkinson. She was 32. Her killer left a boot print on a bloodstained sheet. Forensic examination showed it was a size 7 Wellington, like the one which left an imprint on Emily Jackson's thigh. Otherwise, he left no clues. The identity of the killer of four prostitutes in 18 months remained a mystery. Then the fifth body was found. She died in the children's playground at Reginald Street in Leeds. She was not a prostitute. She was a shop assistant. And she was only 16. A new high-ranking police team stepped in to take overall control of Britain's biggest murder inquiry. For Detective Superintendent Dick Holland, four years at the top of the Ripper hunt began here, on Sunday the 27th of June, 1977, when two young children found the body lying face down in a corner of the playground. The girl was laid there. She'd been attacked and obviously mistaken for a prostitute. She was a young, pretty girl, and uh, obviously it's not a very pleasant sight, and no matter how accustomed to such things you become as a senior investigating officer, uh, it's not pleasant and it does tell on you every time. Her name was Jane MacDonald. She'd been on her way home from a Saturday night out. All the separate murder hunts now came together into one incident room under Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield, West Yorkshire's top detective. Five women were dead, but for the general public in Leeds, it was the death of 16-year-old Jane MacDonald which hit the hardest. What sort of a girl was she? Beautiful, well-mannered, cheerful, always a smile for you. And not <coughs> like any of the others. She wasn't a bit like any of them. She wasn't in their category at all. It's just shocking for a young lass like that. She was beautiful. Before Jane MacDonald, ordinary people in Leeds took false comfort from the Ripper's apparent obsession with prostitutes. The teenager's death cast a chill over every family in West Yorkshire. Any woman out on her own feared she might be the next. Five and two, 52. Eight and nine, 89. Five by itself in the front. Random serial killings are the hardest of all murders to solve. One and six, 16. Because nothing but bad luck links each victim to her killer. But within only two weeks of Jane MacDonald's death, the police got a lucky break. A survivor. Maureen Long was then 42. She was a keen dancer. I used to love dancing. I used to go to, to Mecca at weekend and uh, do a lot of dancing and, well, I used to have a drink and enjoy myself and, and everything and go around with friends, women friends. I was well known in town. Mrs Long came out of the Mecca ballroom one summer's night in 1977 and accepted a lift from a stranger. Oh, all I remember was uh, trying to uh, pick myself up, grabbing hold of grass to try and get up, and I kept falling, and I wondered what was wrong with me. And I kept falling back, and as I was trying to pull, my, pull myself up, I fell again, and then, I was screaming, and I, I heard this dog barking, and I heard someone say, oh, you're all right, 
and that's all I remember that night when you get, get hit over head at back at head you can't remember things police faced a classic ripper attack he didn't rape her or rob her he hit her over the head with a hammer and stabbed her repeatedly in the body do you remember waking up? Uh, intensive care unit in a cot, like a cot, and uh, and I, I wondered what I was doing, doing there, and I had all my hair shaved off, all my hair shaved off, and uh, and. Um, Did you know what had happened to you? Maureen Long never did remember anything about her attacker, and the police had no forensic evidence. When scientists examined the victim's clothes, they found nothing. It was the same in every attack. The Ripper left no hair, no blood, no semen, no trace. All the police had to go on were the perfect tire prints found in the park where Irene Richardson died. Officers had established a list of 50,000 possible cars and spent nine months trying to track them all down, a huge task three quarters completed when senior officers made a disastrous decision to abandon it. It was decided that we hadn't the manpower to run two murder inquiries and a tire inquiry with, with a, a diminishing return from the tire inquiry. That was an unfortunate decision because the Ripper's car was in fact on the remaining uncompleted list. Driving the same car, fitted with the same tyres, the Yorkshire Ripper left his usual hunting ground and ventured further afield. For the first time, he left West Yorkshire and crossed the Pennines. In Manchester, he made his first mistake. He picked up a woman in Moss Side who took him to the allotments near the Southern Cemetery. There he gave her five pounds for sex. And there he killed her. Her name was Jean Jordan, 21 years old, mother of two children. She lay undiscovered for 10 days. During that time, her killer went back to the body. He slashed her again. He tried to cut off her head with a hacksaw. But he never found what he was looking for, her handbag with the brand new five pound note he'd given her out of his wage packet. That five pound note would lead the police directly to the Yorkshire Ripper. Yet he remained free to kill another seven women. Manchester police traced the brand new five pound note recovered when a passerby found Jean Jordan's handbag. The note had been delivered in a bullion van to the Midland Bank branch in Shipley near Bradford. Well, the police turned up one day, the detectives uh, wanting us to help them uh, trace this five pound note, which apparently they thought had come from Shipley branch, um, connected with the Ripper. Hi, good afternoon. Well, it was quite quite a big task, really, because obviously we give quite a lot of money out and trying to trace that one £5 note out of all the thousands of £5 notes that had gone out was quite a big thing to do, really. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. 
It was exciting, I suppose, is the, the only word to use. I was taken out of my working environment. I was picked up by a police car every morning, brought back home by a police car. I never went back to work at Shipley Branch again. I worked in a police station with police for a, nearly three weeks, doing the cash analysis. It was new. It was novel. Thank you very much. The two clerks already knew the five pound note had come in a payroll consignment of 25,000 pounds straight from the Bank of England. Now, they had to work out who got it in his pay packet. It took them only two weeks to narrow it down to 34 local firms, employing a total of 8,000 people. Among them, a lorry driver called Peter Sutcliffe, a married man who just bought his first house. Within weeks of the death of Jean Jordan, he was visited twice by Manchester detectives asking about the five pound note. His wife and his mother both gave him an alibi. They said the family had all been together at their housewarming party. Two years into the manhunt, and bank clerk Maureen Bannum went home from work every night in fear. If you were on your own, you were always very wary, watching if there was anybody about, or, uh, you know, any, any men about particularly. Six women had died. Every woman in the north of England felt the threat. Getting home from work was a nightmare because you were always frightened of somebody, somebody about watching you. You didn't know who was there and you, always, you knew this man was somewhere about or could be and everybody was frightened at the time. And you were always glad when you got home safe. On a cold December night in 1977, 25-year-old Marilyn Moore got into the Ripper's car. Marilyn Moore survived the attempted murder on rough industrial ground in Leeds. Her evidence should have offered vital new clues to Detective Superintendent Dick Holland and his team, especially about the car the killer was driving. They got out of the car, presumably to get into the back seat, when he struck her blows on the head with a hammer. As she slumped at the side of the car, another vehicle with a coupler came in and obviously disturbed his activities. So he jumped back in the car and sped off, turning to go towards the road and the exit across there. As a result, he left curved tire marks, rather like the ones you see on the ground behind me. Three of the tire marks were identical to those found near the bodies of Irene Richardson and Jean Jordan. Police sat Marilyn Moore in all 22 possible models of car. She picked out the Morris Oxford. She was wrong. It was a Ford Corsair. She did make a photo fit which was, with hindsight, astonishingly accurate. But then she started accusing innocent men. Police decided she was unreliable. Unfortunately, we followed the wrong line here. We ought to, in retrospect, to have followed the photo fit and uh, not followed the car because she got it wrong. And so the lorry driver from Bradford remained free. Under the pressure of running six difficult murder investigations in two years, the police were making mistakes, abandoning the tire inquiry, ignoring the photo fits. In January 1978, the Yorkshire Ripper drove his Ford Corsair to Huddersfield, to the railway arches behind Garrard's timber yard, where the town's prostitutes worked. Her name was Helen Ritka. She was 18 years old and had been reported missing by her twin sister. 
the two teenagers worked here as prostitutes together. The surviving sister, Rita, was pictured helping George Oldfield. The public learned how the twins grew up together in children's homes. Information poured in. Police followed up every single lead. On the evening that she met her death, there was a brown van in the area. He followed Helen Rick, her sister, and uh, watched what they did because his kink in life was following prostitutes with the clients and watching their act if it was outdoor. Now, if he'd chosen the other sister only two or three minutes earlier to follow, he would, in fact, have witnessed the murder but unfortunately, he followed the wrong twin. Just bad luck. Without modern computers, the deluge of information had to be catalogued and indexed by hand. A massive job, done by young policewomen like Sue Neve. Five years of Sue Neve's working life is now held in the basement archive at West Yorkshire Police Headquarters. Initially, we worked what, around what we called a wheel, and that was in the centre of the desk. Four indexes could be sat at each corner, and we could spin it round and pick up the cards. But when the wheel became full, <clears throat> then we had to move to these wooden boxes, and they were filed in, well, still in the alphabetical order of surname in the boxes. One drawer here with, I don't know, there'll be upwards of a thousand cards in, I'd say, and we've got 138 of these boxes, all indexed manually. Uh, an awful lot of work, but it was a manual system and it was the only one available at the time, and yes, everything seemed to work fine. It was just the quantity of the work that nearly swamped us, really. Seven dead now. There was a public appeal to help raise a £30,000 reward and a television appeal directly to the murderer. I want to appeal to you to come forward and give yourself up. I mean, we, we may be prostitutes, but we still have a life. I think you've taken enough lives already. I want to talk to you this evening not as a psychiatrist, because I've never met you, and because probably a psychiatrist is the last kind of person you want to see. I do want to ask you to give yourself up. You've no future while you're on the run, and in the end you will be caught. And the longer you wait, the worse it will be. I want you to pick up the phone, not tomorrow, not next week, but now, and tell the police who you are. Give yourself up, now. But he had already killed again. Another victim lay undiscovered on wasteland in Bradford. A woman who died here 10 days before Helen Ritker. Her name was Yvonne Pearson. She had gone missing from her home in Bradford in January 1978. Her decomposed body turned up under a settee two months later on Easter Sunday. Mrs. Pearson's death was the most violent of the series up to that point. The skull was stove in. Whatever had been used, it was not a hammer. There were no stab wounds of the chest, but on the other hand, there were bruising injuries to both the chest and trunk, which extended internally. Could have been somebody drop kneeling on the chest, could have been somebody stamping on the chest. But, as I say, these were serious injuries, not just serious head injuries, but the full weight of the assailant had been used in some way from the neck down as well. You know, I would have thought the prostitutes would have been on the run. I would have thought they would have been leaving this area in dozens and dozens. There's no real evidence to support that that is so. They are staying and they are still uh, walking the streets and unfortunately they aren't being very intelligent about it. Trevor Lepish was the new head of Bradford CID. The man that uh, was involved in this series had to be a, a complete sadist. I mean, he, he was picking victims at random, didn't matter whether they were innocent girls, prostitutes, or whatever. 
But the things that he was doing were horrific injuries. Uh, you might think in your own mind he was a madman. But then, of course, you looked at the facts and looked what sort of evidence he was leaving behind. Uh, and he wasn't a bad man at all. He was a cool, calculating individual that was getting uh, a great thrill in what he was doing, a sexual thrill. And the real thing that bugged you was that you were getting no further forward with it. While Yvonne Pearson's body still lay undetected, police headquarters had received an intriguing letter with a Sunderland postmark. Writing personally to George Oldfield, the letter said, I'm sorry I cannot give my name for obvious reasons. I am the Ripper. Warn whores to keep off streets. Old slut next time, I hope. But it was what he didn't say that worried Trevor Lapish. What disturbed me, and in fact convinced me completely, that if in fact the perpetrator of Yvonne Pearson was the person who had done all the rest, Yvonne should have been in that letter. She wasn't. And I had grave doubts that, in fact, the perpetrator of the crimes was the same person who was sending the letter to George Oldfield. And let Mr Oldfield know my thoughts on the matter. But George Oldfield had a compelling reason to take the letter from Sunderland seriously. Up to number eight now, the letter said. You say seven, but remember Preston, 75. Joan Harrison, murdered in Preston in 1975, three weeks after the first Ripper killing. The 26-year-old was found battered to death at these garages. A bite mark on her breast showed a gap in her killer's teeth. The motive looked like sex or robbery, so police had not included it in the Ripper series till now. Over the next 15 months, police heard four times from the man in Sunderland claiming to be the Ripper. No fingerprints, but forensic scientists got a chemical reaction to saliva. He had licked one of the envelopes. Further tests revealed the saliva came from someone with the rare blood group B secreta, shared by only 6% of the population including the man who left semen in the body of Joan Harrison. The link between the Ripper, the letters from Sunderland and the Preston murder seemed complete. This forensic evidence helped to convince the police that the letter writer and the Ripper were the same person. But when, much later, Peter Sutcliffe's blood was tested, he had a different blood type, B. non secreta so someone else wrote those letters, someone else killed Joan Harrison, crimes which have never been solved, crimes which led the police disastrously astray. We thought the letters were genuine. He had, first of all, mentioned Harrison. He had mentioned the number of murders, and the next one would be an old bag in Manchester, or words to that effect. The next one was. The Yorkshire Ripper did choose an older victim when he crossed the Pennines again in May 1978. Her name was Vera Millwood, and she was the mother of seven children. The ninth victim was a 41-year-old prostitute, a sick woman with only one lung. She died in the grounds of Manchester Royal Infirmary, where she had once been a patient. The attack was typical. Darkness, a deserted space, a hammer to the head, interference with the clothes, stab wounds to the body. This was not frenzied. This was methodical. The wounds were inflicted in a pattern fashion, and then, and again, this emerged increasingly frequently, the instrument was inserted through the same wound. It was being pushed through the skin wound, partially withdrawn, so you had tracks going from the same hole, but in different directions on the inside. There was method all the way through this, concentration, thought, and care. The net is closing. 
I'm anxious that we catch you before you've time to add another death to the appalling catalogue that you've already got to your credit. George Oldfield now sent hundreds of police onto the streets, a top secret operation to track down the Ripper among all the men who went looking for prostitutes. Undercover police tracked half a million car movements through six northern cities, looking for men who went looking for prostitutes in more than one red light district. Officers used the primitive new police national computer, not a database, just a long, long list of car numbers and their owners. It was spewing out numbers literally by the thousands and they were in no order other than the time order of appearing in the prostitute areas. So if we wanted to check up and get the information about the movements of one particular vehicle, we had a huge roll, rather like a long 15-inch wide toilet roll, to roll out literally the whole of the way across the Milgarth incident room floor and people on their hands and knees searching for one particular vehicle. We were utterly amazed, as the figures have shown, with the number of vehicles of men who were punting in prostitute areas. With each one of those, we had a potential divorce. Some men were even taking the wife's car to go and seek prostitutes. And so the wife, was the first person we had to see to find out who was driving. When we were briefing the troops who were doing this inquiry, we stressed throughout our favorite phrase was softly, softly catch your monkey. Detectives tried to be tactful as they made house calls to follow up the sightings of cars in the prostitute areas. Some of the people that we went to see, the male occupants of that house, namely the husband, associated with prostitutes. So we had to be very, very sensitive to that issue, had to be very diplomatic. We would have always preferred to talk to the gentleman of the house away from his wife for obvious reasons. We would say, excuse me, I'm a bit thirsty, do you think you could get me some water? And nine times out of 10, we'd get a cup of tea which obviously would take some preparation out of that room in the kitchen. And then we could talk quickly to the husband about his association with prostitutes. But if it was quite apparent that the man was not involved with prostitutes, we, we used to use different tactics. For example, we used to say to the wife, uh, now's your chance to get rid of your husband if you want. And that was like a nice break. Yeah. The reactions in some houses were different. I'd been thrown out of a house for that in a comic way. In some houses, we know for a fact that it was the husband who was fingered by the wife who wanted to get rid of the husband, not because he was a murderer, but because they were going through a difficult marriage. Police followed up thousands of sightings. Among them, a red Ford Corsair, registration number PHE355G. Its owner, Mr. Peter Sutcliffe, of 6 Garden Lane, Heaton, Bradford. Sutcliffe was interviewed for the third time in August 1978. His car had been seen seven times in the red light areas of Leeds and Bradford. He told the police he was on his way to work, and his wife said they rarely went out at night. That information was duly recorded and filed in the index. The following spring, a building society clerk was walking home from her grandmother's late at night across Savile Park in Halifax. She was the tenth victim. Her name was Josephine Whitaker. She was 19. She'd been bitten by a man with a gap in his teeth. The 
The internal police report made their feelings clear. The dead girl was not a prostitute, nor was her moral character questionable. There is no difference in the eyes of a senior investigating officer whether she's a prostitute or a completely innocent victim like Josephine. The job is exactly the same, but the feelings are deeper. The worrying thing now is that he's moved out of the red light areas where he's operated in the past, uh, which makes it now that any woman is at risk. I was working at Milgar Street Police Station then and um, I spoke to my mother on the phone who lived at Halifax and uh, she said, hey, the, uh, a body's been found on the moor in Halifax, um, a building society girl. So that hit me more because I'd worked at Halifax Building Society prior to joining the police. And um, when I realised where she had been found, it was considered the best area in Halifax and the thought that someone walking alone on that moor could be murdered, I, I just wouldn't have believed it, so it really brought it home to me, just that this man just struck anywhere on anybody. The murder of Josephine Whitaker meant once again all police leave was cancelled and morale was high as Detective Superintendent Dick Holland was called back from holiday to take charge. And there were these approximately 150 officers all assembled waiting for Dick Holland to come and brief us on this new inquiry. Dick Holland came through the door and I, I could not believe the rapturous applause and adulation that man got, myself included, as he entered that chamber. Uh, it was remarkable. The only thing I can liken it to was like the, the Roman cavalry returning from defeating the barbarians and the Roman soldiers banging the shields uh, with the swords. It might sound a, a corny analogy, but that's how I saw it, like a great leader returning to lead his troops. Any murder inquiry is not pleasant. Ten is ten times worse. But you just have to keep your nose to the ground, grindstone. You've got to keep the troops at it and try and show the same enthusiasm uh, when you're dealing with number 10 as you had when you first came into number one. The killer of Josephine Whittaker left behind some excellent clues. Another set of size seven boot prints, this time clearly showing the right boot more worn than the left. And forensic scientists identified globules of engineering oil in the blood from some of her 25 stab wounds. A man with size seven boots and a gap in his teeth. A man with oil on his hands and one boot more worn than the other. An engineer, a factory worker, a lorry driver. No woman in the north of England now went out alone at night if she could avoid it. When we went across to the car park, yes. we always went two, three of you together. We knew we could be the next victim as easily as anyone else. We knew that we mustn't uh, go anywhere on our own. That's uh, right. Yeah, I think one know. of the things we did discuss as well is that it would have been really a feather in his cap if he had managed to get one of us from the mm. incident room. True, yes. Uh, and that's something we discuss quite often. Uh, the fact that we were working in Milgarth, the car park was directly opposite. Um, from an observation point of view, he could have seen straight in, he could have followed any of us to our cars. Um, and, and we often said, what a feather in his cap if he just happened to get one of us on our own. And then a final envelope arrived from the letter writer in Sunderland. At Milgarth Police Station in Leeds, Sergeant Megan Winterburn was working in the incident room. 
Mr Oldfield came in um, and just shouted, Meg, can you come over here, please? And I went across to the door um, and said, I want you in my office now, please. Now, for Mr <laughs> Mr Oldfield to say please, I knew there was something a little bit amiss because he was usually quite a gruff man. Uh, and he either didn't use your name at all or he would just say, you, now, my office. And he actually said, please. So I knew something significant had happened. I remember following him into, the, into his office and he had a tape recorder on the desk and he just said, I want you to listen to this. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But Lord, you are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. I sat with a manual typewriter in a little room and typed the transcription. It was the most peculiar feeling in that room. It was like you, you were sick to the pit of your stomach. There was this tape that allegedly has come from the Ripper and just the, the thought that it might actually be this man's voice, instead of being elated, it, it made my stomach churn. I reckon your boys are letting you down, George. It can't be much good, can you? I had to play it over and over again to be able to, to write the shorthand and then to transcribe it. But yes, first reaction was, this is a man who knows what's happened. It's the Ripper. They went public with the tape and letters from Sunderland on the 26th of June, 1979. Reporters from all over Britain were there to listen. At the rate I'm going, I should be in the Book of Records. I think it's 11 up now, isn't it? Well, I'll keep on going. For quite a while yet. Public response was enormous. 50,000 calls. I can't see myself being nicked just yet. We've got over 200 detectives out now following up leads. Obviously, it's far too early to say what's coming from any of them. I thought... It was taunting us. I thought it was a genuine tape uh, from the Ripper taunting us for not having caught him. The actions, in fact, of a psychopath in that he enjoys the chase and enjoys taunting the uh, investigators. A killer taunting the police, or a hoaxer wasting their time. Desperate for a positive lead and in failing health, George Oldfield got it wrong. For him and Dick Holland, this was the voice of the killer. Obviously, I'll live with that for the rest of my life. I'll live with being a party to the wrong decision. But if we hadn't gone down and it had been correct, that would have been even worse to live with. I warned you in March that I'd strike again. Well, before, we know we've been looking for a man and there are literally millions, and we didn't know where he came from. But now that we can localise the area, the field is not appreciably, as I'm sure you must uh, agree. I always remember the image, seeing him on television, having received the tapes from the man who claimed to be the perpetrator, goading him, and of George hunched over the tape recorder, listening to it, with Dick Holland at his side. And I thought then, this would get him personal. Well, it's been nice chatting to you, George. Yours, Chuck the Ripper. There could be only one victor in this personal battle. Not the detective from Yorkshire. Not the voice from Sunderland. But an invisible man. A man with a Bradford accent. Peter Sutcliffe won 18 more months of freedom. And three more women died.
four years in to the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper, the police were no closer to catching the killer. And inside the files of the forensic pathologist lay post-mortem reports on 10 murdered women. People in West Yorkshire began to lose faith in the police. Before Sutcliffe was caught, I think the majority of people thought the West Yorkshire police were a load of rubbish. The Ripper case was the largest, the most significant, the most demanding terms in manpower that had ever happened in this country. And I don't think the police service were geared to taking on such a long, hard, difficult, inquiry that affected the health and well-being of so many officers. Three more women were to die. Three women whose brutal deaths might have been prevented, but for fatal mistakes made by the police during the biggest manhunt in British criminal history. As I was walking down, I felt somebody behind me, and then I noticed a shadow. And then it hit me from behind, and I went down. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George, but the Lord, you are no near of catching me now than four years ago when I started. In the summer of 1979, the manhunt moved northeast to the banks of the River Weir. A man with a Sunderland accent had sent a tape claiming to be the Ripper. Police called in Stanley Ellis, an expert on regional dialects, to pinpoint the origin of the voice. Well, you see, north of the river distinguishes itself because although it's not Geordie, it's still Wearside, there are some Geordie elements beginning to creep in. Uh, September, October, uh, that was a bit more of the Newcastle kind than, than October that you'd expect to get in Sunderland. It was all, as I say, impressionistic, but it did seem to me that this area, Castletown, was the one that I had the best match. I warned you in March that I'd strike again. Sorry it wasn't Bradford. I did promise you that. The pit but village of Castletown found itself suspected of harboring Britain's most wanted killer. I'm not quite sure when I'll strike again. But it will be definitely sometime this year. Maybe September, October. The Northumbria police arrived in force. We set up in what was on the main street, and just playing the tape, walking around with clipboards, talking to everyone and anyone, trying to attract the crowd. I listened to it at Castletown. We played it to everybody we met. We invited people to come in. It was on the loud hailers all the time from the porter cabin. When I went to the instant room, which I was there for over a year, the tape was played continually to people phoning up, asking them to listen to it and it was playing all the time in your background when you were, whatever you were doing, photostatting, filing, indexing, writing, it was there playing in the background. It was, you know, we didn't have a radio or anything, we just listened to the ripper tape day in, day out. In Castletown Working Men's Club to this day, the bar is strictly segregated. Women are only permitted in one corner. For men and women here, the Ripper connection sowed suspicion and fear. Police questioned everyone. 
every time you answer a question, uh, it's yes. For example, they said to me, do you travel away? And I said, yes, from time to time. Do you go to Yorkshire? Yes. Do you drive a Ford? Yes. You know, and everything. And by this time, you're thinking, hang on, <laughs> is it me? And, and, and of course, uh, with police all over the village, um, it was a frightening time for everybody. I mean, they could have picked on you. And what could you have done about it? I couldn't remember where I was that particular week. I mean, I was in Bradford as it happened. If they had said, you're the river, how could you prove you're not the river? It was horrible when you had them knocking at your door and questioning your husband. And you used to be terrified, thinking it could have been him, could have been him, or you used to suspect everybody. I mean, if it was supposed to be somebody writing these letters in Castledown, was he in Castledown? Walking about, I mean, made you frightened to go out on the night. Only 5,000 people lived in Castletown, yet nobody recognised the voice. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. Nobody identified the man who sent the letters and the tape. You are no near touching me now. The failure came as a great surprise for the dialect expert, Stanley Ellis, and his Leeds University colleague, Jack Windsor Lewis. We were quite sure that its dialect characteristics and its personal characteristics were such that he would be instantly recognised, and therefore well, he would be found. We were amazed when he wasn't found. Even if you do get near... I'd probably top myself first. It could be that it was a member of your family and you didn't want a, a grass on them, that sort yeah. of thing. And you've also got to remember that this uh, whole community did not want the murderers to be from them. And they couldn't believe that all these murders that were carrying on in Yorkshire uh, had anything to do with the northeast of England. Well, it's been nice chatting to you, George. Yours, Chuck the River. George Oldfield, assistant chief constable, taunted personally by the voice, was still sure the tape and letters had to have come from the Ripper. He was wrong, with tragic consequences. 150 officers had now spent a full year checking cars in the red light districts. A black sunbeam rapier was seen twice in Leeds, once in Manchester, and 36 times in Bradford. The police national computer revealed the name of its registered keeper, a Mr. Peter Sutcliffe. In July 1979, Detective Sergeant Andrew Laptew was still a constable. He was sent on a routine assignment to interview the driver. We were always told that it could be the next door you knock upon, the next phone call you get. So you went to that house with an open mind. The next door DC Lab 2 knocked on was number six Garden Lane, Heaton, in Bradford. Home of Peter Sutcliffe, a man of 33 with a Bradford accent, and his wife, Sonia. They seemed an odd couple. He was a, a lorry driver, she was a teacher. He was very quiet. She was quite vociferous. The thing that struck me more than anything was the uncanny resemblance to the Marilyn Moore photo fit. The victim who survived, there was an uncanny resemblance. I had bad feelings about the man. Um, he had too many uncanny links with what we knew. There was a gap in his teeth. His shoe size fitted the suspect's shoe size. Both my colleague and myself, when we left the house, sort of looked at each other and said, we're not happy with this man. There, there was something sinister about him, something weird. And there's always your own particular irrational gut feeling, if you like, uh, about a person. Well, I submitted a, a report about our suspicions. We got the report typed up and we got it forwarded to the incident room and we brought it to the attention of 
the senior investigating officer. The senior investigating officer was Detective Superintendent Dick Holland. I don't specifically remember the Laptew report. It passed through me it, along with many, many others, hundreds of thousands of others, and unfortunately, I filed it. Peter Sutcliffe had the wrong accent and the wrong handwriting. It's something I will have to live with for the rest of my life. It shouldn't have been filed. I wish I hadn't done it, but you can't turn the clock back. Uh, it was one of those things, but I must say that at that time, um, nobody, no one, had seen all the information on Sutcliffe coordinated into one file. We were using a manual system. There were no computers of the type that there are today. We live in a computer age, and everything about uh, Sutcliffe would be on one file. It never was. Sutcliffe had now been interviewed five times. Crucial information about his earlier record lay scattered in different police files. Information DC Laptew did not know. The things I didn't know about Peter Sutcliffe when we knocked on his door was that he had a conviction for going equipped for theft. When I made an inquiry with the records office, all I got was a note saying he had a conviction going equipped for theft. It did not say that the conviction was going equipped for theft with a hammer. That conviction was in 1969, so the police took this mugshot six years before the first murder. In the weeks after DC Laptew put in his report, the killer used his hammer again in Bradford. The Ripper had given up on red light districts. Now he prowled anywhere young women could be found out alone after dark. His 11th victim was a student. She had a night out with friends in a pub close to the university. She walked home 200 yards up the main street. He killed her, yards from her own back door. Her name was Barbara Leach. She was 20 years old and came from Northamptonshire. He hit her over the head with a hammer and stabbed her eight times. Eleven murders in four years. Once again, Detective Superintendent Dick Holland was summoned back from a family holiday. I came into the office, still in my holiday clothes, and came to the scene here to get the picture as early as possible from the discovery of the body. She'd obviously been attacked, and the body placed under the steps in the corner with rubbish and old carpet piled around her. She was slumped in a sitting position with her clothing disturbed and blood running down from the head injuries. Police faced mounting criticism. For the first time, the Ripper had killed a university student, a clever girl, a middle-class girl. Women took to the streets in protest at four years of terror. Personally, I took the criticism very badly. Uh, anybody mentioned to me, if anybody didn't know I was a police officer and said, oh, it's about time the court, this ripper, what do, they, what do the police think they're doing? Uh, I used to jump down the throats. I, I was really, I could be quite nasty about it. But at the end of the day, the people doing this inquiry were human beings with human feelings, uh, their human frailties, their own vulnerabilities. But on top of all this, they, they had a job to do, and to be criticised and kicked in the teeth for it as well. Um, it was hard to take, yeah. 
Overwork and hard drinking had already ruined the health of George Oldfield. He was a man of few words, and he could be a very harsh boss who would keep you going all night, uh, sometimes at 4 or 4.30 in the morning, and expect you back on briefing at 9 o'clock the same morning. But he drove himself just as hard and stuck at it the same. I suppose you can say that in retrospect. It told on his health and, I think, eventually killed him. George Oldfield recovered from his first heart attack, but his time in charge of Britain's biggest manhunt was over. A hundred miles northeast of Leeds, one police officer began to have doubts about whether the Sunderland letters and tape really came from the Ripper. David Zacherson was then a detective inspector in the Northumbrian force. I began to have doubts when I looked at the three letters before me. There was nothing in those letters which immediately shot out. Um, you know, that this fella has to be the killer. The unpublished full text of the letters had been circulated confidentially inside the police. Detective Inspector Zacherson examined the wording and found clear similarities with an earlier case, the still unsolved Whitechapel murders. The original Jack the Ripper killed five women in the East End of London in 1888. In that case, too, the police received letters. 1888, that joke about the leather apron gave me fits. 1979, that photo in the paper gave me fits. We were left with the fact that the Ripper had no real originality. He was reading up on a man who was operating almost a century beforehand. Does some psychopath who gets gratification through murders really need that sort of thing? Does he need to borrow the phraseology? Another clue. Police knew Vera Millwood had been a patient in the hospital where she was murdered. Funny, said the letter writer. The lady mentioned something about being in hospital before I stopped her whoring ways. We'd been told this was something which only the killer would know. When we were researching our newspaper articles, bang, there's the Daily Mail, obviously published before the letter was sent, detailing fully that Vera Millward had been in the same hospital for some sort of operation. So we'd lost what really was a vital linchpin. I want to make a distinction here that it was quite right to publish the letters and tapes. Quite right. That was a line of inquiry. It should never have been a point of elimination. And that to me was fatal. Language experts Stanley Ellis and Jack Windsor Lewis also began to have doubts. At the end of September 1979, I wrote to the CID in Bradford uh, and I sent a letter, I did the Ripper tape and letters, and in that I said, for the past few days I've been troubled by the thought that we may be hunting a writer recorder who is not in fact the Ripper murderer. And I continued to believe that and uh, was very troubled that the letters were always than the tape were always taken into account as if they must be from the murderer. For instance, at one time they had a, a bulletin circulated to all policemen which said, don't waste time on anybody who hasn't got a Geordie accent. And that was ridiculous as far as we were concerned. They, uh, the accent was a red herring as far as we were concerned. Watch your front, watch and react. But nothing could convince West Yorkshire that the letters and tape came from a hoaxer. Sure when I was trying to get in, but it would be definitely 
not even what happened 12 days after the death of Barbara Leach to PC Keith Mount in Sunderland. I was brainwashed with that voice, brainwashed with it. I knew it better than my own voice. I was in the office by myself, and then the phone went for the millionth time. So I picked up my pen, and there was a pad by the phone, picked it up. Police instant room, Sunderland, can I help you? And then this voice came on, and I thought, well, shit, this is the ripper. This is the man. And, and, and the hairs on the back of my head stood up. And he's just saying, tell him, it's a hoax. The tape's a hoax. The hoax had disappeared. He's never been caught. Yet West Yorkshire police stuck to their belief that the killer had a northeastern accent. Frustrated detectives began to re-examine old leads. Two years earlier, when Jean Jordan was killed in Manchester, police had found a brand new five pound note in her handbag. They failed to trace who had given it to her. Manchester police now tried again and made a crucial breakthrough. They managed to narrow down the list of workers whose pay packet could have included that note from 8,000 people to just 241. After four and a half years, the hunters had their quarry within reach because lorry driver Peter Sutcliffe was employee number 76 on that list. Manchester police asked West Yorkshire to check all 241 names in their files. When the list of 241 went to the major incident room, it came back in so far as Sutcliffe was concerned, no trace. Now, when we looked at this as a review team, we did our best to identify what had gone wrong. It was impossible to ascertain accurately what had gone wrong. It had either been mistakenly searched, and Sutcliffe had been missed, even though he was in the indices, but probably, probably, his papers were out of the manual system without the card being in the manual system to say that his papers were out. A simple clerical error uncovered much later when Sir Lawrence Byford officially investigated what went wrong. Massive card indexes were the only source of information on 11 unsolved murders. And Peter Sutcliffe's details were mistakenly split up on four different index cards. In the first few weeks of the new year, 1980, Peter Sutcliffe was interviewed for the seventh, eighth, and ninth times. That summer, he was stopped for speeding and arrested for being drunk in charge. The arresting officer checked with the Ripper incident room and was informed that Peter Sutcliffe had been eliminated from the inquiry. He killed again in August. The body of the 12th victim was found in a garden in a leafy suburb of Leeds. Her name was Marguerite Walls. She was 47 years old and a civil servant. On bonfire night, 1980, five years after the first murder, the Ripper went back to Huddersfield. He'd killed there before. The 18-year-old prostitute, Helen Ritka, murdered in the red light district. This time, he chose an ordinary housing state. His victim, a teenage mother. She'd walked a hundred yards to the shops for a packet of cigarettes and was on her way home to her baby and her boyfriend. Her name was Teresa Sykes. She was 16 years old and she survived. When you're 16 and you, you don't even think about it, which you appreciate, I didn't. It's like it can never happen to me. I mean, even when I knew that it was about, it was uh, what happened to me. 
it was just before I got to the lamppost up there and then once I got under the light I looked round and he was behind me and I looked at him and he looked at me and it was sort of like a couple of seconds and he walked off down the path and then obviously I thought yeah it's all right it's gone and I carried on walking and I'm walking down here um, I got like just past the second light and noticed the shadow on the floor. Didn't hear anything, just the shadow. So I knew it was still there. But I still got the feeling that there was somebody behind me. And when I saw the shadow, that's what really frightened me. I couldn't run. <laughs> I couldn't do half of things that you always think, yeah, you can do. And I couldn't do it. So I grabbed hold of the gate and that is when he hit me. I started screaming, I can remember screaming and then I can remember the steering footsteps running and then the next time I came out and then took me in the house and I still didn't realise I was really hurt until I actually got in and saw blood. How close to home were you? My home's there, I can see it from here. <laughs> Detective Superintendent Dick Holland lived only a mile and a half away. We were only minutes behind him with dogs on the scene pretty quickly. He ran down here and somehow got it. We don't know exactly his route into the back alley, but the dogs picked him up, picked up scent in the back alley. And uh, in fact, uh, my daughter at that time was living there next to the passage, right under the scene. So incidents like that do have a personal touch. It's frustrating every time you get near to a criminal uh, and uh, just miss them. All the luck ran on his side right up to when he was finally caught. That was the first piece of the first time the carts fell our way. The Yorkshire Ripper disappeared through the warren of terraced houses. In five and a half years, this was the closest Dick Holland ever came to his quarry. Twelve days after his attack on Theresa Sykes, Peter Sutcliffe killed for the last time. He was in Leeds. He bought a fast food supper in Headingley. Around 20 past nine, a bus from the city centre brought a young student home from an evening class. Sutcliffe followed her. Her name was Jacqueline Hill. She was 20 years old and hoped to become a probation officer. I am always held the view that this man will continue to kill until he's caught. No woman is safe whilst he's at large. George Oldfield was back at work after his heart attack. Jacqueline Hill, the 13th victim, was buried in her home village of Ormsby, near Middlesbrough. The Prime Minister was furious. Mrs Thatcher had a daughter who'd been a student. Colleagues had to restrain her from going to Leeds herself to take personal charge of the investigation. Chief Constable Ronald Gregory bowed to the inevitable. He accepted help from outside his own force. Well, I think the time had come. Uh, you might say the time had come a few murders ago, but it's certainly come for a, a rethink about the whole investigation. I went to see Mr Gregory following the Jacqueline Hill murder, and I suggested to him that the time had come, having regard to his overloaded police officers who were doing the Ripper case, to bring in a think tank comprising 
some of the best brains I could think of who've been involved in serious murder investigations, New Scotland Yard and elsewhere. And he agreed to that, and between us, we in fact selected the team. A fortnight after the death of Jacqueline Hill, Byford's super squad arrived in Leeds to spend 17 days reviewing the case. There were one scientist and a group of senior policemen, including the future chief constable of Strathclyde, Andrew Sloan. It's easy to be dramatic, and uh, terms like shell shocked easily come to mind. But people who I knew from the past, who had been good, diligent detectives, who worked very hard and uh, very skillfully, they had this sort of uh, air about them that uh, they were almost punch drunk by banging their heads against uh, the wall of, uh, of this inquiry. Another member of the super squad was one of Britain's top forensic scientists, Professor Stuart Kind. His scientific expertise allowed the super squad to tell West Yorkshire police almost exactly where the Ripper lived. So what I did was this. I drew a graph rather like this. And on this axis, I started at 6 p.m. and finished it. Using skills learned in the war as an RAF navigator, Professor Kind plotted the location, the time of night, and the time of year of each Ripper attack. But I did find that when making allowance for the variation in the length of day, that the late flyers in each case were in the Leeds and Bradford area. I came up with a theory that the Ripper probably lived in the uh, in Bradford area, and possibly in Manningham or Shipley. Manningham and Shipley are only three miles apart. Peter Sutcliffe's home stood between them. A force of 5,000 police officers had worked two million man hours. Swamped by work, the police effort was now hopelessly compromised by mistakes. The nine interviews which failed to identify the killer, the criminal records which didn't mention a hammer, the belief that the Ripper had a northeastern accent. In five and a half years, the killer had made only one mistake when he left a traceable five pound note in a victim's handbag. Then in December 1980, Peter Sutcliffe went to a breaker's yard in Huddersfield. Here he made his second and critical mistake. He stole a set of number plates and fitted them on his car. Christmas 1980, 13 women were dead. Rumors that the killer would strike again kept many women off the wintry streets. So the Yorkshire Ripper left West Yorkshire and drove south. It was January the 2nd, 1981, and two officers from the South Yorkshire Police were on routine night patrol. I was a probationer at the time and out on patrol with Sergeant Ring. He'd asked me if I was, uh, if I'd done a prostitute file, pr process one for court, and uh, I told him no. So he says, well, we'll go and see if we can find one. He drove onto Melbourne Avenue, which is this road, and as we were approaching Light Trade's house, he said, uh, there's one there, just pointed. We drove straight up uh, the driveway and parked directly in front of the uh, Rover car that they were in. I got out of the car, approached the driver, 
Um, asked him his uh, name and address. He actually gave me uh, false details. Sergeant Ring approached the female occupants of the car, had a conversation with them. Uh, we then did a PNC check on the uh, vehicle, the number plates that were displayed. That came back as a Skoda car, and obviously the one that they were in was a, a Rover. I then uh, arrested uh, the driver of the vehicle, uh, who I later found out was, uh, when we got back to the station, was Peter William Sutcliffe. Sutcliffe said he needed to urinate, so the two Sheffield policemen let him go in a corner. And then they took him back to their police station under arrest for stealing number plates. He was very agitated and uh, apprehensive. Uh, even when you were talking about the uh, simplest of things. I got the impression that he wanted to get out of the police station as quickly as possible. On and off, I spent about uh, eight hours with him uh, in this room. Uh, there was a photo fit of the Yorkshire Ripper on the filing cabinet in here, which depicted a man with black hair, beard, moustache, very much like uh, Peter Sutcliffe, actually very good photo of it. They had a suspect who wore size seven boots and had a gap in his teeth. But they had no real evidence. Next day, the two Sheffield policemen went back to the place where they'd made the arrest. They looked behind the oil tank where they'd let their suspect urinate. And there, one of them found what they'd missed before, a hammer. There was a bit of conversation as to who it could belong to. He was saying that it could belong to uh, the handyman, because there was an oil tank at the side of uh, where it was. And that's when I stood on the wall and shone the torch down and said, well, the hammer might belong to him, but who does the knife belong to? And. After that, uh, we knew that uh, the person we'd arrested uh, was the man who was commonly known as the Yorkshire Ripper. Confronted with the evidence, Peter Sutcliffe now confessed to killing 13 women. The next policeman to visit the house in Garden Lane was Detective Superintendent Dick Holland. I decided to go and see Mrs. Sutcliffe and to have a look around his house. The first thing I saw was a wooden block with kitchen knives in, the type of block with slots through. It was obvious that the second largest knife of the set was the one I had covered in clear polythene in my hand, the one that had been found behind the oil tank at Sheffield. I wanted a search of the area where I would find tools, and I searched the garage. This peculiar type of hacksaw was hanging just inside the garage door. When I got back to the police station, with the hacksaw in a polythene bag to preserve the scientific uh, evidence. One of the interrogating team came out of the interview room and said, boss, he's just told us that he went back to Manchester with a hacksaw and tried to cut uh, the head off Jordan, but the hacksaw wasn't big enough. I said, I know. I've got the hacksaw. Now, the detective chief inspector, who had not been privy to this information of the hacksaw we were looking at, looked in amazement and said, fucking hell, boss, you kept that dark. The use of the hacksaw on Jean Jordan was a gruesome detail that only the most senior officers knew. From the chief constable of West Yorkshire, Congratulations. It was common knowledge, I think, that Mr Gregory said that uh, whichever officer arrested Peter Sutcliffe would be promoted, no matter what rank. But 
obviously I'd, I'm not in the West Yorkshire Police, I'm in the South Yorkshire Police. Uh, I hadn't passed my exam, uh, I was still a probationer. Um, so it never happened. A man is charged with a Ripper murder. The chief constable could not conceal his relief. Ronald Gregory announced the arrest to the world's press, with George Oldfield at his side. We are absolutely delighted with developments at this stage. Absolutely delighted. Can you, you, can you all smile? Really delighted. George is delighted as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can imagine how I felt. I was absolutely stunned. I was totally gutted because I remembered interviewing the man, I remembered my suspicions, my colleagues' suspicions and what we'd written about him. And I thought what might have been, what things could have been so different, not for my own personal satisfaction, but for the relatives of those victims. A crowd of 2,000 people greeted Peter Sutcliffe's first court appearance. The accused was the oldest of six children in a mill worker's family from Bingley in West Yorkshire. His childhood was unremarkable, and he left school at 15. He was 23 at the time of his arrest for going equipped for theft with a hammer. The young Sutcliffe worked for a year as a grave digger at the Victorian Cemetery in Bingley. In later conversations with defense psychiatrists, he claimed that his killing career was inspired here when he heard the voice of God instructing him to rid the streets of prostitutes. The Old Bailey jury did not believe him. On the 22nd of May, 1981, the jury delivered its majority verdict. The Ripper was bad, not mad guilty of 13 murders and seven attempted murders. Sonia Sutcliffe's husband received 20 life sentences and the recriminations began. My inquiry was not there to produce scapegoats so much as to produce the lessons for the future. Sir Lawrence Byford was instructed by the government to investigate what had gone wrong. He found the officers and their filing system were hopelessly overwhelmed. The Byford team asked for all 77 photo fits provided by victims and witnesses to be collected together in one room. We walked in through the door and all the pictures are up on the wall and it was like a blow in the stomach almost to recognize immediately that there was Peter Sutcliffe uh, looking at us from uh, these assembled pictures. We were aware, of course, we had the immense uh, advantage of hindsight and that uh, they had been put up like that for the first time, but they also included quite a number of the assaults in which uh, Sutcliffe was suspected. But even without that knowledge, it was obvious that uh, there was a dark-haired, bearded man appearing again and again. Their conclusion? The deaths of Barbara Leach, Marguerite Walls and Jacqueline Hill could have been prevented. That hits very hard professionally and makes, makes me feel very, very sad. And uh, also, it made us absolutely determined that there should be no repetition of this sort of thing. Today, the Ripper Incident Room in Leeds is home to two current murder investigations. 
uh, and I don't know whether they've lifted anything off it, but nobody's done anything with the inside of the canopy. Officers all over Britain work according to principles laid down by the Byford report. Better training for senior officers, standardised filing systems and computers. I'm no computer expert, but I said to the experts, look, I want you to think of the Ripper inquiry where there were in excess of 600,000 statements, manual index cards and so on and so forth. And I want to be able to put my finger on a computer terminal and in those 600,000 to come out on the terminal as a printout any mention of a man with a dog. Can you do that for me? And the answer was, yes, we think we can. D-O-G. Dog. The national computer system arrived in 1986. It runs a powerful database, named after Sherlock Holmes. Detective Sergeant Andrew Laptew became the resident Holmes expert at his station in Bradford. They often come up and say, which button tells me who's done it? Well, it won't do that, but it will point you in the right direction, and it's a, a valuable tool in any major inquiry. A serial killer only becomes a serial killer because he's cute enough to avoid detection early by the police. But I like to think that with the advent of the home system, with the new procedures and the compatibility of major incident rooms, one force with another, the chances of the serial killer getting away with it have been considerably lessened since the Ripper investigation. Peter Sutcliffe is now 53. He's locked away in Broadmoor Secure Hospital, where another inmate attacked him with a screwdriver and blinded him in one eye. But Sutcliffe was not the only man to be punished as a result of the Yorkshire Ripper case. We didn't anticipate the degree of criticism that we got. They published their reports and senior officers were criticised. As a result of that, I and other officers were banished into uniform to different parts of the force. We were moved, it was said at the time, in my case, for career development. Career development with 20 months to go to pension. Obviously, that was an excuse for what was a political move with a small p. Mr. Oldfield was moved to become ACC support services. Nothing of a job, really. They control things like horses and dogs and the, the trivia of the police force. I felt sorry for him because he had worked to the stage of injuring his health. Uh, and uh, then uh, just got kicked out sideways as a result. Four years later, George Oldfield died. Chief Constable Ronald Gregory retired in 1983 and now lives in Portugal. He sold his story to a newspaper for reported £40,000 and admitted personal responsibility for going public with the hoax letters and tape. The teenage mother, Teresa Sykes, slowly recovered from the three hammer blows to her head. Almost 20 years on, She's rebuilt her life and lives quietly in West Yorkshire with her youngest son. I used to go up to the bedroom every night, put wardrobe behind the door, put dressing table behind the door. I'd sleep with a knife under the pillow, which my mum used to go by me about. But that was the only thing that sort of like made me feel that bit safer. It took away my freedom. It took away a lot of my life the night that he attacked me <laughs> and that I never uh, get back. I'll never ever get it back. 